the audio summary of how to make people like you in 90 seconds or less, written by Nicholas Boothman. Introduction. What's your greatest fear? When asked this question, people usually mention common fears like heights, spiders, or public speaking. But deep down, our true fears lie in something more revealing and vulnerable. We fear being awkward and alone, realizing that nobody likes us or that we aren't anyone's top choice. We fear being friendless. That's why, whether we admit it or not, most people desperately want to learn how to make friends and be liked by others. As we navigate through life, we often wonder, am I doing it right? Do people genuinely like me? What are their thoughts when I enter a room? These questions can fill us with horror and anxiety, making it easier to avoid interacting with others altogether, even if it leads to the very thing we fear most, being alone and friendless. In this summary, we'll dive deep into the essential skills needed to conquer these fears and connect with others. Chapter 1. The First 90 Seconds You've probably guessed the significance of the 90 seconds in the title, it's the time frame in which people form their initial impressions of you. But have you ever wondered what factors contribute to those impressions? Studies reveal that first impressions are influenced by various assessments, such as intelligence, trustworthiness, success, and social status. Some factors are predictable, like the assumption of success or popularity based on design or clothing. However, there are unpredictable factors beyond our control. For instance, we can't change our inherent features. Yet, research from Princeton University shows that people consistently perceive individuals with round, baby-like faces or feminine features as more trustworthy. Our gender, ethnicity, attractiveness, and even the presence of tattoos can also shape initial impressions, often influenced by latent sexist, racist, and classist stereotypes. When we consider these studies collectively, it becomes evident that our first impressions are formed hastily and often based on biased assumptions related to gender, race, and class. Unfortunately, we can't change someone's innate biases, especially when they're rooted in factors beyond our control. However, there are certain things we can do to make a positive first impression, and we'll delve into those tips in the next chapter. Chapter 2. Get your body talking, in a good way. Body language speaks volumes, often louder than words, especially within the first 90 seconds of meeting someone. Now, we can't change people's perception of us based on our face shape or other physical quirks, but we can certainly make sure our body language sends the right message. Let's dive into the fascinating world of open and closed body language. Don't worry if you're not familiar with the technicalities, you'll know it when you see it. Picture this, you're giving your teenage son a lecture about his excessive video game time. If he responds by crossing his arms and rolling his eyes, well, it's crystal clear that he's closing himself off and creating an emotional distance. Similarly, when you meet your best friend for lunch and she welcomes you with open arms and a big smile, you instantly feel the warmth. So, when meeting new people, don't be a grumpy teenager, let your body do the talking and communicate openness. Stand with your arms hanging loosely at your sides, indicating you're at ease with yourself and others. Orient your body toward the other person in an inviting manner, showing that you're interested in them and what they have to say. Lean in slightly to create a friendly atmosphere and make them feel comfortable in your presence. Now, on to maintaining eye contact. Don't go overboard and creepily stare them down, you don't want them thinking you have a secret dungeon in your basement. Instead, initiate a few seconds of direct eye contact while wearing a smile. It simply conveys that you see them, and you're positive and willing to engage. Plus, here's a fun bonus, research from Loyola Marymount University showed that eye contact during conversations correlates with higher perceived intelligence. So, good eye contact not only makes you appear smart but also boosts their impression of your IQ. And if you already wear glasses, well, that's an added touch of perceived intelligence. Just remember, no need to wear glasses if you don't need them, good eye contact will do the trick. Bear in mind, these nonverbal cues set the tone before you utter a single word. Now that you've established a positive vibe through your body language, let's turn our attention to the spoken part of the interaction. This is where many people start to stumble, worrying about saying the wrong thing and making themselves unnecessarily awkward. But fret not, 
my friend, and don't panic. The key is to keep it simple. Smile, introduce yourself with a friendly hi. How are you, and share your first name. It's an instant icebreaker that invites the other person to respond in kind. And if you're concerned about forgetting their name, just repeat it right away in a natural way, like saying, Allison. Great to meet you, Allison. You can even throw in a compliment about their name or share a funny anecdote like, Oh, my sister's name is Allison. Laughter always helps. Chapter 3, Beyond the Awkward Introduction Alright, so you ace the introduction, feeling confident and making a great first impression. Now what? Here's where the nerves kick in for many folks who struggle to think of conversation topics or fear saying the wrong thing. But fear not. This chapter is all about building a good rapport, the magical connection that makes communication smooth and harmonious. Rapport, my friend, is when you and the other person understand each other's feelings or ideas and communicate like a well-oiled machine. That's what we're aiming for. Establishing rapport usually happens naturally when you find common ground with someone. Let's say you discover you both have a mutual friend or go to the same gym. Boom! Instant connection, and you can chat freely about shared interests. Even if you don't have much in common at first, finding that common thread creates a sense of kinship and enjoyable communication. But what about those situations where you don't have an instant in? Fear not, my friend, there are other ways to build rapport, and it all starts with your attitude. Here's the scoop, your attitude is the ultimate deal-breaker in any conversation, regardless of shared interests or the other person's response. The author breaks it down into two types, useful and useless. And trust me, you want to be useful, not useless. A useful attitude means you approach the conversation with a positive outlook, focusing on what you want to achieve. It's thinking, I want to get to know this person or I want to make a positive impression so they can help me with my customer service issue. On the other hand, a useless attitude is all about dwelling on what you don't want. Picture this, your McDonald's order gets messed up, and you angrily demand to speak to the manager. Your thoughts are consumed by how mad you are and how you don't want your order to be wrong. Now, here's the thing, being useless and confrontational rarely gets you anywhere. Instead, even in moments of conflict, adjust your attitude and focus on what you want from the conversation. In the McDonald's scenario, shift from I don't want my order to be wrong, to I want someone to help me make it right. See the difference? This change in perspective allows you to approach the situation calmly and kindly, increasing the chances of getting the assistance you need. After all, people are more likely to help you if you're nice to them. So, opt for the nice approach, my friend. And remember, the body language tips from previous chapters can be your allies in this quest for rapport. Chapter 4 How T.O. Be a Good Conversationalist, with a Touch of Humor now that we've covered building rapport during conflicts, let's dive into rapport building strategies for more neutral situations. So, how can you be an amazing conversationalist? Well, it all starts with questions that invite the other person to talk their heart out. You know, like the kind of questions that make conversation experts, psychologists, and professional interrogators go, oh yeah, that's the good stuff. Disclaimer, maybe don't lead with that question in an actual conversation but you get the idea, right? If you're not familiar with the five W's and an H rule, don't worry, it's as simple as eating a whole bag of chips during a Netflix marathon. It's just a fancy way of saying you should ask questions starting with who, what, where, when, why, or how. These questions are the bomb because they open up the conversation. For instance, imagine you're at a fancy new cocktail bar, waiting forever for your drink. Sitting next to you is a stranger, equally thirsty for their beverage. If you want to strike up a convo, you can use the body language tips we've covered, adopt a positive attitude, and say something like, So, what drink did you get? That question is like a big, open door to a conversation. It can't be answered with a simple yes or no, so it invites the person to share all the juicy details. Once they spill the beans about their drink choice, you can respond with something like, Oh, that sounds awesome. I went for the espresso martini. I hear it's supposed to be out of this world delicious. 
Now, this gives the other person the chance to chime in with their love for coffee or perhaps share a hilarious anecdote about their past experiences with espresso martinis. Either way, it keeps the conversation flowing naturally and creates a friendly vibe, just what you're aiming for. Even if your tastes don't match, the friendly atmosphere allows you to connect and enjoy each other's company. Because, hey, you don't have to be clones to be friends or have a good chat. In fact, some of the closest friendships thrive on differences. Another trick to keep the conversation going is to ask follow-up questions based on what your conversation partner said. For instance, if they mention, I don't go out often, but I had a really stressful day at work, so I thought a nice cocktail would help me unwind, you can respond with, oh, I totally get it. What do you do for work? No matter what other strategies you employ, showing genuine interest in the other person is the golden ticket to connection every time. Plus, it guarantees that the other person will form a positive impression of you because, let's be honest, who doesn't appreciate someone being nice and interested in what they have to say? Chapter 5, Final Summary, Still Funny, But Wrapping It Up Feeling awkward and terrified when trying to make a good first impression is totally relatable. We all want to make friends and have people like us, but sometimes it feels like we're navigating through life blindfolded. Fortunately, you don't have to stumble around in confusion. By practicing open body language, throwing in positive nonverbal cues, and mastering the art of asking engaging questions, you can leave a lasting impression within the first 90 seconds of meeting someone. But remember, once those initial 90 seconds are up, keep the conversation flowing by starting with a friendly introduction nailing the name game, and asking open-ended questions that show your genuine interest in their stories.